Okay, so we start again with our 11 o'clock uh, show. Um, so Martin will talk to us about Kodi, coding version 18, features and improvements. Martin. Okay, uh, welcome anyone, everyone, for the people that were already here for VLC. Um, we're kind of in the same boat as VLC. We had a, vlo a lot of code that no one understands. So they're, they were trying to clean up and we're basically trying to do the same. Um, same as getting everything working on all platforms uh, with all the new codecs, uh, 3D, uh, HDR stuff, uh, Wayland. So we're kind of in parallel what VLC is doing, cleaning up our stuff. So since last week, we finally released uh, version 18. It's about, I guess, a year late. So it doesn't really that matter that much. Uh, we started in November 2016, um, during the time that 17 was about to come out. And uh, we continued on working on 17 with uh, bug fixes. But others were already starting to clean up our code. And we finally released on the 29th. So our goals were um, yeah, improve what we already have. There were not many features we actually wanted to have. And understanding our code, cleaning it up, because it all uh, originated from the original <coughs> Xbox. We use about 800 private APIs on Windows, still from the old SDK that kept working. And we should have cleaned that up at some point. So the goal w was um, break the code to C plus 11. Some parts were already going to 14 already. already. Uh, remove all the old code. <coughs> Obsolete libraries, because we, what's, what's cracking? This one? Not working well. <laughs> Sorry. Nice. Okay, let's try. Um, we even kept compiling libraries we didn't even use, so. We removed like 10 libraries, like what, is the, uh, what do we use it for? And actually no one could answer it. So we just removed it and then everything kept working. <laughs> I think last week we even, or some months ago, we even removed another one. So we thought we were done. And at least uh, <coughs> the best part is we don't have to maintain all that stuff anymore. Um, we use FFmpeg for everything, basically. We only are three patches behind on their uh, 4.4 release, 4.04. So we try to keep that up to date as, as possible. Because in the past, we had like 500 patches on a really old library inside of our code. So, And we try to upstream the patches as best as we can. It's not always possible, but we should at least try to do that. Um, this is the biggest part, uh, binary add-ons. Um, for the uh, people that already uh, are known with Kodi, uh, they know all the add-ons and the plugins, like the skins and uh, the audio and the video. But we now also moved basically most of that was in core that we could rip out is now an add-on as well. So we now have some Hive decoders uh, for pictures, so basically, you go to our repo and you install that. So it's not compiled in the core. So our core code is becoming much smaller, and we just say plug it in. The same for PVR. That was were kind of um, add-ons already, but they were always shipped with the, the core code itself. So now you can just install one front end for whatever back end you have, and don't have all the, the other 20 shipped alongside. Input stream. So the nicest part about this, we can actually um, play back DRM protected content from within code <laughs> using whatever uh, platform features uh, it supports. So like on Android, we can do Netflix full 4K. So basically, if you go to... Uh, Somewhere on the web, you can find a, a Netflix plugin. You install that, you enter your uh, 
password and username, so it's fully locked down to Netflix itself. But basically you can load your library there, play back any file there, and it works. We're still looking into uh, the Atmos part, but for full K works on Android. On other platforms, Windows is not working yet. Linux uses uh, software, so we are kind of limited to 720p. So Android is fully functional for that. How about ATL? Everything DRM protected by Widevine should work. So if someone writes a plugin for that, it works. So what we did is 3,000 pull requests, 10,000 comments with 60, 36 people and about 9,000 changed lines. And user base, yeah, we don't really track that. We have some stats from Play Store, we have something for Windows. Um, we can look at the amount of downloads, but that doesn't really matter for us because we just want a nice product. Play Store says 7.8, Windows says a couple of hundred thousand, and then the rest is from whatever site. And even on, like on Android, uh, we're not an Amazon store. At least seven. So maybe 25 or more. Rough guesstimate. So we always plan changes, but we never promise to incorporate them. And the reason is, well, people change interests. They get a life. They get married. They get kids. And then they vanish. So. They start to work on something, and then, so we're not, never going to say next year we will do whatever feature, because we don't know. So we only say when it's done, then when it's actually in the core code. And even then, it might be not enabled by default, because we're still not sure if it actually works. The net best part is, this is kind of the same talk as last year. What we said we would do is actually also done, because we didn't do any, anything more. And the best part was the Xbox. That caught everyone by a surprise. Because um, you all know we started on the original Xbox, locked down, then the 360 came along, nothing worked anymore. So we thought Xbox will never happen again. And suddenly the UWP platform came along, was like, it's not going to happen again, because it's too complicated. And then someone sent an email, I have it running. Uh, what? <laughs> so that was actually in the start of uh, on Windows itself, so not on the Xbox itself. But the platform should be similar. So we started in June 2016 with the Centennial Bridge. We still use it today because uh, UWP has limitations. Uh, no access to local uh, drives and all that. So we push a uh, UWP version to uh, Windows Store and then a higher version with the bridge version on top of that because you cannot filter easily. So you have to do some tricks to get the, the correct version rolling out. And December 2016, the initial work actually started to get it running. And in 2017, we had the first version actually booting up, which was quite amazing. And then half year, a year later, it was actually kind of done, not fully feature complete, but we actually put it out as a beta. I think we are now at 200,000 installs, so it's not so bad. Some websites actually called us the best, uh, what do you call it, best game of the year for Xbox, because <laughs> there was actually nothing else out there. Um, what else did we do? Video player. As said, we started out on the Xbox, and it grew and grew and grew. And it wasn't really designed to take all on all the other platforms. So we started to improve that code, and it was all entangled. It's like quantum entanglement. Pull one side of the code, and the other one breaks. So they now actually started ripping that out, uh, cleaning it up, pulling it apart. And it's now video player is kind of a thing of its own, but still. Weird stuff happens when you change playlist code and then video player starts breaking. So we still want to improve that. As I said, a lot of legacy code, 
not as efficient as it should be. Uh, just stacking on code and code and code, not platform agnostic. Linux was hacked into a Windows sections and all that. So when you actually maintaining it was so hard. And the most best part of cleaning up your code is it's maintainable. Like JB said, if you don't understand the code, you cannot uh, maintain it anymore. So you need to understand what is actually happening. So by actually cleaning up your code, ripping parts out, you start to understand what is actually happening. And that's, I think, the best part we learn about that. Just start pulling strings, see what happens. And if you see something happen, actually put it as a comment in the code so other people don't have to look again what's happening. So the DRM part was actually one of the biggest things we wanted to have. So it's using a, a, a special API we made, input stream. So we basically made an add-on that uses that API that actually tells the player, play this, and then the player handles everything else. And on Android, we then tell media codec, um, play this content. We don't know what it is, so it's still entirely DRM protected, but play this. We don't want, don't want to know what it is. It's also f uh, more future proof now with HDR and whatever, 8K, 12K, 20K. And the future is also, we want a headless mode, so the player was fully entangled with the rest of the code, so you couldn't really play something in the background without the GUI doing weird stuff. I could show screenshots, but there's no point. It's still just a player that plays video. Input handling. And with input handling, we actually mean controllers. Not video input, audio input, but actually controller plug-in. We all know the, the problem with if you have a NES controller or a Sega controller, you plug it in, you have to configure all the keys again. Mm. Not anymore. You just plug it in and it works. There's also a configuration menu, so you can actually change the button mapping, but plug in any controller and it will always work. And this was actually part of RetroPlayer. It's been five years in the making. So one of our uh, developers is actually a mechanical engineer who was got bored and actually started coding on RetroPlayer. And it took him four years, several attempts to get it right. And what basically is, everyone I guess uh, knows RetroPie and whatever uh, other software there is. But basically this runs in the Kodi GUI. You open any ROM file and it will actually automatically select the, the the ROM, the emulator you want, combining with the input handling, any controller you want, so you can play NES games with a Sega controller, no problem at all. So yeah, so his goal was, uh, he loved playing the old games, and back then there was not really anything that was user friendly. You had to do weird stuff to get uh, an emulator running, so that was his main goal, getting this done. Also, the, the controller part was a real hassle. And some stuff is still future work. But one of the best part was actually the save, pause, and rewind, and play again. Because everyone knows that you die, or you jump in a pit, and it's like you have to play all over again. You can just rewind what you're left off. So go back like a couple of seconds, and then start playing again from the moment you want it. So this is a part of the how the menu looks. So you can actually just pause the game, maybe you can close it down, it will, I'm not sure if it's actually saved, maybe not, not in, yeah. So it's actually saved where you left off, so you can actually resume at any point in time. And how the, the rewind actually works, because it's actually a video frame, as he uses it, you can actually just rewind like any video and then start playing hit play again and then start controlling the game again. We ha he had that working like three or four years ago and we had like a tiny kid coming in. That's all he did. Just die and rewind and die and rewind. <laughs> it's kind of a cheater, but why not? Um, 
We also had some shaders on top of it, so you can actually uh, look the the emulators looking like an old CRT monitor again for people who actually want that. So it tries to upscale as best as it can, and if you want, you can make it like look like an old CRT monitor again to have that old feeling on your 4K TV. Uh, this is the controller um, configuration. So basically, uh, all the controllers are also add-ons. So y if you say, okay, I have this uh, controller, it, you can install that add-on, that profile, basically, and you can then change it to your liking. If you want A and B switched, no problem. And it will actually save it and plug in any controller. When the rest of it was done, well, Android was always... Uh, a hassle. We started working on Android in version 2.4, I think. Android 2.4. There was no media codec back then. So back then we wrote our own player. Uh, later came along Lip Stage Fright. And then, but still a mess. Uh, every manufacturer did their own thing. Uh, playback was a hassle. And then we started working with Google actually to help improve media codec. Like, this, we need this, we need that. Audio, why don't you have this codec? Uh, why do you have all these stupid APIs? Just give it the IEC input. We'll ha handle all the packaging ourselves so we don't have to deal with your timings. We can do the timing internally. Uh, Windows now has the 64-bit version. So that was something like long overdue. And the problem with that was we used so many uh, third-party libraries. We, we had to c compile them all as 64-bit. Not a problem in itself, but there was no 64-bit code in those modules. So we actually had to rewrite parts of those modules to be co compiling them as 64-bit as well. And we tried to remove modules we actually didn't need anymore by replacing them with something that works. Um, so that was basically 64-bit Windows. Uh, it's a bit faster. People screamed like, it's much faster. We want Windows 64-bit, must happen. Well, we actually tested it, and it wasn't that f much faster. Um, it's only faster if you do 4K. But that, back then, it wasn't really that obvious yet. Uh, Wayland support was added again. Uh, five years ago, we had a GSOC student who did the Wayland stuff Initially, uh, I think he lost interest or there wasn't really big enough support uh, around to do Wayland properly. So it kind of decayed and we actually ripped it out again. And then we had uh, another GSOC student, Philip, who redid all that part again. Um, then we, for Linux, we also have uh, direct render management. That's especially for the low power platforms. Improves playback a lot. Um, and we now use CMake as our build system. And that means that it's actually much more easy to maintain. Because in the past we have like five build systems for five different platforms. And now we have one. Add some lines, add a new file, need to compile, done, works. Took a lot of time, it's still ma uh, dark magic if you look into it. But we have some gurus that actually know what's happening. And then the most important part was binary add-on repository for almost all platforms. As I said, we already had binary add-ons to some extent, but we had no way of distributing them. So we actually had to package them into the installer itself because there was no real way to make that easily installable afterwards. Because you have Windows, you have uh, Linux, OS X, iOS, Android, but we wanted to push a new update when we fix something and it was still not possible because we had to take into account all the platforms, all the variations and it took, actually took us like two years to figure out how to properly do this. Like if we compile one, uh, it's all one code, if we compile it, it needs to be distributed to like five, six different versions taking into account all the 64-bit, 32-bit, ARM, and now in 18 we actually finally did that. So our installer went from 
70, 80 megabytes to 35, just ripping out all that stuff. And you install it basically when you want it. We have dash to port, PVR improvements, uh, music library, or is it really improved? Uh, Bluer is better. And basically in two years, the list is so huge. It's so much to, to even talk about. And on release day, sadly, our biggest fear was something will break, which we never thought of, and that was for UWP, the migration, because Windows does different things when you do that. We have a roaming profile, and the other one is not. And that's all, that was it. And for, for version 19, we have Python 3 coming. And we don't really have anything planned, because we are kind of feature complete. So we're hoping that our uh, GSOC project will bring up some amazing things. Um, one thing that's also coming up is the database layer. Uh, it's a total mess. Uh, it's holding us back so much because anything you do always goes through um, our file handler. So anything you do goes through that and it's a big bottleneck. So we hope to rip that out as much as we can and profiles, like have kids, a kid profile and a parent profile or different names. So those are the biggest features we want to work on. But we don't have to promise anything. Because <laughs> someone needs to be interested in actually doing that. And we hope, always hope that the, the common public will show interest in picking that up. And we will always try to help them because it's really amazing to get through we had our retro player guy looking at the, in it, and he got scared. And for the rest, we, always, uh, we also had to maintain all the rest of our infrastructure, which is so much, and your own personal life. And that is, the big, I think, the biggest problem for everyone. You want to work on something, but you still have a life at work. That was it. We have a few minutes for questions or amazing ideas for your roadmap. We're always looking for GSOC projects. So we have a wiki that uh, lists uh, the GSOC project, but we can always have some great ideas. So yeah, um, you said that you ripped out the, the uh, decoder add-ons and everything. Will you help the users so that they will auto-load or tell them that they're missing an add-on? It actually does, need. it automatically does that. Okay, so you don't have to look through it and figure out that, oh, I need this nope. binary add-on. No. Nope. So like it. if you install the Netflix add-on, it will automatically install the, 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 the DRM plugin that automatically pulls down whatever you need. So it's actually plug and play. So all you need to do is enter your username. And then the next one, I saw something about NVIDIA cards and the new version and not supported. What's that about? Um, I'm not the really the technical guy about... Uh, it was not sub supposed to be supported with GBM backend or something like that? Philip, or can you... Do you know anything about that? Okay, <laughs> um, so the deal with NVIDIA is that uh, the binary drivers do not uh, support the standard uh, EGL interface that all the MISA and other drivers support. Uh, they use uh, EGL streams, which is a different API, and we won't implement that. It's just the same with a lot of, for example, Wayland compositors. Like, you cannot uh, run KDE on NVIDIA binary drivers is uh, the same reason. So our, our goal basically is to... Not with the uh, GBM backend, no. With Novo? Uh, with Novo, you can run, yeah. So our goal is to don't uh, do every edge case. If uh, with Android, we had a lot of problems with the uh, video playback, and we actually ripped out the biggest manufacturers, AM, like AM Logic. We basically said, hey, we, if you want us to run on your platform, do your job. Write a proper driver. 
So we then uh, ripped out our AM logic code and said, we support media codec. This is the official API. If you do not support it, tough luck. And that actually got the ball rolling that I actually started improving. And through that, we actually got talking with AM logic to actually improve the Linux kernel. So like the project like uh, LibreELAC didn't have to do all the hassle with all the variations again. So they tr actually tried to upstream their drivers as much as possible to the Linux kernel. So we don't have to go through all the edge cases, loopholes, uh, private APIs. Because that's all, it will break at some point and someone needs to maintain it. And we basically want use the API as designed, not anything else. So we have a lot of users like. So LibreLAC is a good use case, yes, for using yeah. any You, yeah. you mentioned on the uh, slides about the uh, release day that uh, you, you feared some of the uh, SMB problems. Did they materialize? As yes. <laughs> yes. Can you tell a bit more about that? Um, at some point during the release cycle, I think Windows disabled SMB1. And for some reason, people use uh, Windows 7 as a media server. So we did. We have some configuration in the code. I think like LibreOlac has it better on some platforms or not. And during the last year, we had a lot of non-working installs because of the SMB problems. Like, yeah, it's suddenly stops working. Yeah, but you have SMB one on your server, and we only want two and three, but you can override it again, and then. It's always a hassle bit. On Android, SMB2 doesn't really work because then on the Android platform, stuff needs to be done as well. And we basically have not enough developers to actually support most of it. So we actually now said, whatever, we've been working on this for two years, cut the date and release it, and we'll see what happens. Thank you, Martin. Remember, you can rate the presentation on the website. Thank you. Plugin for 4K playback uh, on Android for Wide Vinyl 1 for Fnatic.